with the HIV and TB as there are public health issues in Africa in general. Even though it might be more prevalent in around Southern Africa, South Africa, but it's still, still very prevalent all across uh, Africa. So yeah, I did shift my focus from malaria to TB when I got to South Africa, but uh, with working with TB now, still, still feel like that. This is Immuno Africa, a podcast dedicated to spotlighting African immunology research. Here, we amplify the stories of Africans researching the immune system to tackle the continent's growing burden of infectious and non-communicable diseases. I am Weld Okete, a biochemist and science communicator from Nigeria, keenly interested in research about the immune system. My interest in immunology began during my undergraduate days at the university. Over the years, that initial spark has steadily grown and found expression in multiple ways. On Immuno Africa, I explore and communicate research about the immune system through the eyes, hands, and lips of the Africans who do them. Whether you are a seasoned immunologist, a budding researcher interested in immunology, or an untrained lay person, I hope the time you spend here rewards you remarkably. Dr. Mukishe is a Chief Research Scientist and Welcome Intermediate Fellow in Public Health and Tropical Medicine at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. In this episode, he talks about how he carved a niche for himself in the highly competitive and rapidly evolving field of immunology and infectious diseases. Originally from Cameroon, Dr. Shea took an early interest in malaria research, particularly because of the disease's prevalence in his own country. However, when he searched for better opportunities to pursue research, took him out of Cameroon, little did he know that it would alter his interest and lead him to the field of tuberculosis. Dr. Shea has now found a place in tuberculosis research, where he studies a largely underexplored, unconventional class of T-cells that hold immense potential for vaccine development. Well, how did he discover and embrace this class of T-cells and what makes them unique? Yeah, so my journey started in the rural areas of Cameroon. So I'm uh, born in Cameroon, raised in Cameroon, but I uh, live and work in South Africa now. So yeah, I come from uh, Cameroon in the Northwest region. So I grew up, so I always had uh, an interest to study science, either do engineering or do medicine or something related. So yeah, so when uh, I completed high school and studied uh, biochemistry at the University of Yaoundé One in Cameroon. So I did biochemistry. So when I completed, so now I, I had an interest to, to do research. So during my undergraduate uh, degree, so I started developing uh, interest in medical research. So um, by the time when I completed my undergraduate degree in biochemistry, as uh, uh, you might know, yeah, so uh, the research infrastructure in Cameroon was still uh, very limited for what I wanted to do. So I wanted to conduct research around uh, infectious disease and uh, immunology. So that was my interest. But at the time, uh, uh, yeah, the infrastructure and, um, and it, yeah was not. Uh, well developed, so I started to look outside, and that is how I ended up in South Africa, so at the University of Cape Town, where I started my postgraduate degree in immunology and infectious disease. So in um, 2005, if I'm seen then, yeah, never look back. So it's been an interesting uh, journey. But yeah, started in, with biochemistry in Cameroon and ended up in immunology and infectious disease in South Africa. Thanks for that beautiful introduction and giving us a background to how you started out. So I want to ask um, why immunology for you? So if there was any experience that made you wanted to do infectious diseases and immunology research? Yeah, no, um, no direct personal experiences apart from when you growing up in the rural areas in Cameroon, there is a lot of, there like a lot of malaria and interest to try to find a cure right, for for the health conditions that were affecting us growing in the rural areas, especially malaria. And also at, at one moment, I, I had the uh, severe, severe chicken pox. So yeah, I was quite severe that, uh, that I almost lost my life to it. 
so and uh, from there so I, I started thinking about uh, how to to solve uh, challenging health problems especially for people with little access to to health care where we used to live so the nearest health center not even the hospital the nearest health center was probably about two hours two to three hours uh, journey by foot so which was not very easy so and um, my passion has always been how do we find solutions to a challenging health problem in the rural in the rural areas so for people who have uh, less access to health care and also less resources in terms of money to ask to buy medication and all of that so that is how my passion for infectious disease started so uh, earlier on with malaria and then personally with you know, chicken pox and all of those. But anyway, when I ended up in South Africa, I started now to study immunology and infectious disease. So the, the challenges in South Africa were different from those in Cameroon. So in, uh, here in South Africa, you don't have much of much of malaria, so much of uh, tuberculosis and, and HIV. So and because my passion was always be to find solution to challenging health problems in where I where I am. So since I was in South Africa at the time that I started my research, so I then developed an interest in tuberculosis and HIV research. And that is uh, what I've been doing ever since. So b- will you say your your migration to South Africa kind of changed your focus, took away your focus from malaria and shifted it to um, tuberculosis and HIV? Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely. Because yeah, like growing up in Cameroon, there was there was TB, but it was not as as uh, yeah, prevalent. Yeah, yeah, you will really not see it as much as you will see you will see malaria. So in Cameroon, yeah, I had more malaria. In but when I moved to South Africa, I was starting of my postgraduate studies and research, so there was no little to no malaria and no of TB and tuberculosis. So then my focus then shifted to. Um, the tuberculosis and HIV, but since those were still uh, infectious disease and also, still also even though uh, in West Africa you might have more malaria, but you still have an epidemic of uh, TB and, uh, and HIV. So it's still HIV and TB are still uh, public health issues in Africa in general. Even though it might be more prevalent in, around Southern Africa, South Africa, but it's still, still very prevalent all across uh, Africa. So yeah, I did shift my focus from malaria to TB when I got to South Africa, but uh, with working with TB now, I still, still feel like that I can uh, still make a difference across Africa, not only in, in South Africa. Yeah, that's true. I think your story is uh, making me want to ask certain questions about um, the whole concept of you no know, leaving your maybe your hometown or your home country to get better opportunities, and how it can change your your interest or change your perception of what is important or what isn't so important. Because you know, currently, I think it's quite common in Africa and maybe some other countries that um, students would want to leave their home countries to other countries, maybe within the African continent or other continents, say like um, the US or UK, to uh, because of their better infrastructure for conducting science research. And sometimes they start doing research that may not be directly relevant to the African populace. So I, I, I would want you to comment a bit on that from your own experience, of course. So how changing your environment can also change your research interest or focus or change your perception and um, perhaps what 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 can be done to um, mitigate that effect uh, because I, I I I'm not sure but I don't know if you if you were to get an opportunity to go back to Cameroon or maybe conduct research on malaria if you would still be as excited considering the investment and commitment you've you've made to HIV and TB research in South Africa. Uh, thank you very much. I think yeah, that is a relevant question and something that we see uh, every day. So, you know, like uh, I said earlier, for example, when I was at the uh, University of Yaoundé, one in my undergraduate degree, the infrastructure was like so so poor, right? So that sometime when we had to do practicals, we we'll go to the lab. And they will just simply just explain to us that this is uh, this is what we were supposed to do, but because there is there are no no reagents or no equipment to do to do that, or maybe there are equipment but they are broken equipment already, and uh, and they, they just explain the practical. This is 
what you are supposed to do, but you you are not we are not able to do it because of lack of reagent. And then they will just give us sample data from an experiment that was conducted from somewhere else, maybe from a textbook, and then we'll just go and write a report and that sample data. <laughs> and also based on the explanation that we were given, given about how the, the experiment was supposed to be done. And we'll just go write a report and that that, that will be our practical. So we'll practically write a, a report about the practicals without actually doing the practical. That's because there was no no literal or no infrastructure to do, to do the experiment. And that is for me, having developed the interest to do the research to, to pursue research so that was really then not a good a good environment then for me because uh, i wouldn't then be able to achieve what i wanted to achieve in a in such an environment in such an environment where there, are, there is no infrastructure so that is how then i at least i already had the, the basic the basic knowledge about science and about research back home so i needed not to to look elsewhere Naturally, my first point was uh, was UK actually. So I, I applied to the UK. I actually got admission in, in, in like two schools in the UK, but the fees the fees was so so high that I, I couldn't actually afford. So then I, I applied to South Africa, where I also got admission at the University of Cape Town. But at least the, the fees was bearable. So that's how I, I ended up in South Africa. And then before taking up a research in, in tuberculosis, so switching the environment now, coming to South Africa, where most of the research now is mostly around tuberculosis, HIV, or almost all the, the diseases that are more prevalent here. But we still have, have a lot of research on, on malaria in South Africa, actually. So most of the groundbreaking research in Africa on malaria and development of malaria uh, treatment and all of those and actually from from South Africa. Oh. So that is just that uh, in May, so I, I decided since I, I wanted to do research on something that I see, that I see so I could see more of, of uh, tuberculosis uh, than malaria. So that's how I, I ended up and was mostly again based on the, on the infrastructure and the availability of the resources. So like then coming back to your question, so most people will actually end up doing research in a field, not because it's a field that they are really interested in, but because of that is where the opportunities are based on the environment where they are. So if, if somebody living from Nigeria or Cameroon, for example, who had the opportunity to do research outside and if the, if the funding and the infrastructure, for example, is now, where the opportunities are in cancer, for example, and you wanted to do malaria, but then there, is, there are no opportunities for malaria, you must end up doing cancer research, not because it was your initial interest, but because that's where the funding is and that is where the opportunities are. But maybe when you start with cancer, and obviously in the future, you must still find your way back to, to your initial interest. So, but for me now, having uh, established my footprint now in, um, in, yeah, in tuberculosis and HIV research, I don't really see that I, I can switch back to malaria. So because even if I, my plan is still to, to go back to Cameroon at some point, at some point, but if I go back to Cameroon, I'm not going to switch back to malaria, right? Because there's still a problem of tuberculosis and HIV in Cameroon as well. So I will still, still have to continue with the tuberculosis and HIV. Based on now my experience over the years, and when I apply for funding, I apply for funding now to do to do tuberculosis and HIV research. And might be in Cameroon where malaria is, is prevalent. My, my focus might shift a bit to looking probably as say the interaction between malaria and, and tuberculosis, for example. Not that like completely switching from, from TB to malaria, but I might, if I still want to do something in malaria, I might look at possibly looking at the, the, the interaction between malaria and tuberculosis, yeah. They are the, no, they, like I said, maybe to Samara, end of the day is more about where the funding is, where the opportunities are. Because most of the time, the basic principles are the same, right? So a basic principle of T-cells in tuberculosis and T-cells in malaria might be the same, even though in terms of the mechanism, they might differ in terms of how they, how they control the disease. But the, the basic uh, uh, principles of immunology will remain the same either in tuberculosis or, or malaria. I think it's cool that you've kind of found a way if you were to merge both your initial interest and the 
current interest there's you found a way to do that so exploring the intersection of tb or hiv and malaria in your home country cameroon hopefully other persons can also understand that even if they face similar situations that they have to branch out of their initial interest they can always um, find a way to create that intersection that connection and marry the two interests together so dr muki shay got a research grant in 2018 via the Welcome Intermediate Fellowship in Public Health and Tropical Medicine to explore the role of a special class of T-cells in tuberculosis infection. By exploring these T-cells, he hopes to contribute to the development of more effective tuberculosis vaccines. For the next phase of our conversation, he provides updates on the research funded by this grant. Getting the grant here yeah, was, was just a combination of the, the work that I've that done uh, for, for several years leading up to leading up to that. So, for example, starting on my postgraduate research and postdoctoral research, I was mostly focusing on the, the innate immunity, which is like the first line of defense. The first line of defense when you are exposed to, to bacteria. So, so initially, my initial research was focused on and the innate immunity working on monocyte and dendritic cell. So when I when I, I completed my PhD working on TB vaccines on mon, on innate cells and, and also the genetics, so the combination of immunology and genetics. So I, I did my postdoc at the University of KwaZulu Natal still in, in South Africa. So where I switched completely from from TB. Uh, my all my postgraduate degree up to PhD was all about TB and vaccine. And then in my postdoc now, I switched completely from TB to HIV. So I'm really doing HIV immunology, where we are looking at the mechanism of transmission of HIV across the female genital tract and how to prevent that transmission. So after the, the postdoc, so I ended up in, in industry, where I, again, I, I switched completely back from HIV into, into tuberculosis. And then in the industry now, we are working on uh, developing and testing of tuberculosis vaccine across the African continent. So we are doing endpoint immunology of looking at them, how the, the vaccines are inducing the immune responses and which immune responses were relevant to the, to the effectiveness or the efficacy of, of the vaccine. So I did that three years in industry, and then I went back to academia, to, to the university, University of Cape Town, where I did my postgraduate degree back in about 2016. So uh, that's then how I looked back and I was like, okay, all my postgraduate degree was on TB vaccine. My postdoc was purely on HIV, and my work in industry was more now about looking at, um, at how vaccines were inducing uh, T cell responses and the mechanism of action. So then I, I wanted now to, to bring all of that in together. Uh, everything that I've done previously in HIV and TB and, and vaccine, I wanted to bring all of that of that together. Then I, uh, I started looking at you know, uh, how to establish the coverability. The research is, is a very competitive field and getting grants, getting grants is not easy. So you need to find a niche with something that is relevant probably with very less less competition so to increase your your livelihood of, of getting the grant so then that i then focus now my my interest and in, in looking at because i was already working on tb vaccine so looking at how tb vaccine prevents diseases and also looking at how the tb vaccine induce the immune response to prevent the, the disease what i was asking myself is in the absence of of the tb vaccine why can't our immune system to protect us from, from the disease? How we can harness our natural immunity to develop the vaccines, so to develop the vaccine based on what we understand from our natural immunity, rather than bringing the vaccine to, to, to direct what our immunity should do. We should actually look into our immune system uh, natural immunity and let it detect what how the vaccine should work. So that was how my my research started. How I co I coined my research of trying to harness the natural immunity to to direct how we develop the TB vaccine. So then my my research question then uh, I was asking is how how to look at the immune cells in our body, how they how they protect people especially healthcare workers. So healthcare workers who have worked with TB patients for a long time and they still don't have any evidence of, of the TB infection. 
because you will understand that uh, TB is transmitted by aerosol when you when somebody coughs and you inhale you, you are likely to get infected but you have people now who have worked with TB patients for a very long time and they see don't have any evidence of infection at all then I thought to myself okay that is interesting if they have worked with TB patients for 10 years 15 years and still don't have any infection and there must be something in their body that is protecting them from from the disease so then that's how then my I coined then my research that I, I sought funding from the Wellcome Trust, so which is a UK-based organization. So then I, my research now is then focused on understanding natural immunity, especially in healthcare workers who have worked with TB patients for a long time and they still don't have any evidence of infection to to see in their in their bodies in their immune responses. So that immune responses genetics. I'm looking at all of those to see if I can find something that is associated with the protection and then how you can use that information to develop the vaccines that can then protect uh, protect a lot more people. The research, my research now was just not something that came out of the blue, was like taking the bits and pieces of things that I've done from my postgraduate training, from my postdoctoral training and from the time industry and putting all of that together to create a research niche for myself. So what have you done so far on this on this research what what have you discovered what is interesting finding have you made on this um, on this research yeah, so in in trying to to understand the our natural immunity and how it protects us and how we can use that vaccine so I, I decided to to focus my interest on on a particular cell subset that is called a mucosa associated invariant T cells. So there's a long name, but the short name for it is MET cells, M-A-I-T, MET, MET cells. So these are the, the cells that are practically focusing on to understand their role in protection from, from uh, infection. And then again, why why I, I, I like this cell is the cells, these cells have just been recently, we were discovered maybe over about 30 years ago, but uh, it was only in the last 10 years that a, a lot of interest has been focused on these cells because it came out that these cells can have an important role to play in protecting us from, from several diseases. So, and then I, I focus now on cells. And the, the interesting thing about these med cells is that, like I, like I mentioned earlier, I did my undergraduate and my postgraduate degree looking at innate cells which are a monocyte and dendritic cell. And then when I was doing my postdoc in industry, I was focusing more on T cells, which is part of the adaptive immune system, which is like the second line of defense. So the innate cells, or innate immunity is the first line of defense. Adaptive immunity is the second line of defense. But with the innate immunity, you have monocyte and dendritic cells. Adaptive immunity, you have T cells. But then the interesting thing about med cells is that they sit directly in between. They have properties of the innate immunity and they have properties of, of T cells. So that is so like, okay, I work with innate immunity, I work with T cells, but then there are these cells that are just sitting right in the middle, in the middle of uh, innate immunity and adaptive immunity. So data had already shown that these cells are important in protecting especially animals or mice from infection. So I wanted to then see whether uh, that also can be translated in human and protecting human from uh, from from disease. So that is the, the cells that I've been working on. And uh, so I had a gun in 20, 18 and so it was a, a five-year grant so and we started you know, enrolling patients and then in 2020 the worst happened COVID came and so had a devastating effect on our on our research for almost like uh, two years so we are not able to do any anything but because of COVID everything especially South Africa was severely hit by by COVID mm -hmm. among other African countries where South Africa was about the hardest hit so everything practically shut down so all our research was shut down and uh, and even when when after more than a year of practically doing nothing and when we restarted so it was still too slow it was actually just about the past year that we that everything seemed to have come back to normal and we we resumed the recruitment of um, of our study participants. We just recently uh, completed the recruitment of the participants into the study group. So we are uh, we are screening the healthcare workers to test whether they are infected or, or not using a, a TST, which is a skin test and the interferon gamma release as a quantiferon. And then we are you know, identifying people who are 
who are, are resistant, who don't have any infection at all. And then we, and also those as a control group, we are then looking at them. People who already have infection. So there are two important groups: those who have the infection and those who don't have the infection, despite being exposed for a minimum of five years. So we we recruited those patients now, and we collected a whole lot of samples, blood samples for immunology and blood samples for genetic genetics analysis, as well as so a lot of information about their risk factors. So we just completed that recruitment in I think about a month ago actually. By, Facebook of December as when we completed recruitment. So we are just about to start the, the analysis at the moment. So we don't have any data yet, but at least we have all the samples and everything that we need to, to do the analysis. So maybe in the in the next few months, six months or so from now, I think we will be able to, to tell you what the what what the results show. But at least for now we are just about starting with the with the analysis with the analysis because we have all the samples now and just to start with the analysis yeah so we don't have any concrete concrete data from the from the study yet but in the next six months we hope to to have some interesting data oh oh that's 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 fine then i think mm-hmm. immuno africa will be waiting so once answers have come would we'll, would we'll bring you back on the podcast to yeah share those answers with us and um, of course share their implications for the development of um, vaccines and um, the protection offered by the immune system no definitely definitely i'm happy to share the results when yeah they, when they become available yeah thanks so i i think i would still ask one more question about um, the mucosal associated invariant t cells you've provided information about why one of the the reason why you you chose that niche based on your experience and then based on the unique um, features of this class of cells. I want you to provide some, a few other unique characteristics of this class of T cells for someone who might be listening to this podcast that may not be, may not have heard of them before or that may not be so familiar or maybe even a scientist that may, may also have interest in this um, class of cells. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So just for simplicity, so we have cells that are classified as um, classical T cells or conventional T cells, which are yeah, CD4 and uh, CD8 T cells. But then the, the MET cells with other with other cell types, such as NK T cells, they, they fall in the category of T cells that are then described as non-conventional non-conventional or non-classical T cells. And uh, why they are why these MET cells are classified as non-conventional was obvious as it's obviously because uh, the their characteristics, the way they function and the way they become activated is different from from your classical C D eight and C D four T cells. So for for as basic immunology we were told or we, we learned that the um, C D four and C D eight T cells before they become activated and and do what they need to do such as uh, a protection protecting people from different infections they require three different signals three different signals to to become activated and the three different signals will be like that there is like antigen presentation where the cells of the innate immunity take off the bacteria break them into little pieces and then send them to cells to say oh there is a foreign object here there is a, a there are bacteria present here and then uh, there is that antigen presentation and then the second thing is, is that they require certain cytokine cytokine uh, activation where again cytokines that are still produced by cells of the innate immune system such as monocyte so they produce certain cytokines that are then also involved in activating this conventional CD4 and CD8. And also there is a third signal. So uh, the first signal is antigen presentation. The second signal is cytokine, a cytokine produced by the innate immunity. And then the third signal is called uh, cause stimulation, where there are also markers that are expressed on both the on both the the, the T cells and the innate cells when they when they interact with each other. So then you, you have those three signals that are required before a conventional CD4 or CD8 T cell is activated. 
and before these three signals come together and these cells become activated, it can take several days to several weeks before the conventional CD4 and CD8 T cells are effectively activated that they can then do the work that they need to do. And now when you come now to the MET cells, which are the non non conventional T cells, they, they don't require the three signals together like the, the normal CD4 and CD8 will do because those CD4 and CD8 require those three signals together before they become activated. But when it comes to MET cells, they just require one of those signals. They either require the cytokines or they require antigen presentation and then they become activated and they do what they need to do. And that can only take just about a few hours and then the MET cells are already activated com compared to days to weeks for normal CD4 and CD8 to become effective activated. So the, the one good thing about these MET cells is that they are activated quite rapidly just by one, one of the two signals, either cytokines or antigen presentation, and that can happen within hours. Unlike normal CD4 and CDS that will require days to weeks and, and all three signals must come together before they become effectively activated. And that is what for me, I just thought that because these cells are also located in the lungs, they are, they are high normals in the lungs, so my, my thought was that if they are activated this rapidly, maybe when when people are exposed to to TB, when the TB bacterium get in, uh, TB bacteria get into the lungs, that these cells are, are effectively and rapidly activated, and then they are able to kill and eliminate the the bacteria in the lungs before an infection is established. So my hypothesis for my research was that. For those who are exposed to bacteria, to TB, and don't become infected, it is because the med cells that are resident in their lungs are able to rapidly clear the bacteria and then before the infection is, is established. So that was my, my hypothesis. Yeah, so that is the, the interesting thing about the med cells is that they, they are rapidly activated. And for now, they are practically been associated with, with most, most of the diseases that you, you can think of, whether it's tuberculosis, whether it's HIV, whether it's even um, so non-communicable disease, such as diabetes and, and, uh, and all of that. So most of these diseases, have been associated with uh, with med cell function. So med cell function are quite a versatile type of immune cells that have been linked to almost every type of disease. Most of the diseases have an effect on, on med cell function, either in terms of med cell numbers or in terms of med cell function. Uh, yeah, there are still a lot of things I can talk about med cell, but essentially the, the important things are that they, they, they are in, in addition to them sitting in the borderline between their properties of the innate cells and also properties of the of T cells of the adaptive immunity, they are also very rapidly activated, like uh, within hours, and they are able now to to perform the work that they that they need to perform same as as T cells, but the normal CD4 and CD8 T cells will require days to weeks to become activated. As usual, Dr. Shea has a word or two for young scientists who need help to clarify, define and carve their own niche in the broad field of science, biomedical research or immunology. Let's hear him out. Yeah, so there is really no, no formula for it, uh, well, in, in my view. But I think is that you, you always need to, to be able to, to read broadly, right? And, in, in your reading, in your reading, try to always not see how you identify the gaps, the gaps in literature, because it's from the gaps that are in literature that you eventually uh, define your, your research niche. So you might be interested in TB, for example, but a lot of people are, are working on TB, but in, 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 in trying to read, to read broadly about TB, for example, and looking at the immune responses, so you, you need to, to be able to sort of have a bit of critical mind to try to, to identify the gaps in, in the literature that is available, and it's from trying to identify those gaps that you eventually define what your, what your research niche should be. So, uh, while well, there are always gaps, but we, we just need to be able to, to find those gaps that fit in with your interests the interest of what you what you need to do so uh, for me the first thing is you know, always you know, uh, read broadly broadly and have a, a, an open mind yeah and be critical about about what you read 
and how that is relevant. At the end of the day, once we define what your research niche is, it's about how will that make a difference in the health of, of people. Because like for when you apply for funding, so funders usually will be looking for your result might not make a difference in, in five years or in 10 years, but in the long run, how will the results from what you are proposing to do how would they change the health condition of, of the society or where you live, of the of people in the low and middle income countries, for example. So it's about doing the research that you think in the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, or even 20 years can contribute. The, the research on its own might not be the solution, but how does it contribute to the broad understanding of how we can treat diseases, how we can prevent diseases. And once you start to look in that direction and then you reading broadly and identifying the gaps and also just being passionate about what you what you are doing what what your interest is because it's your passion that will probably get you going when when days are tough when days are dark maybe when when the funding is not forthcoming and when you're not getting the results that you expected but it's still your passion about the research field that you have chosen that will get you through through those difficult times yeah so it's about getting something that you're passionate about, reading broadly to identify the gaps in the literature, and all in all, so uh, thinking about how does that research, how would it improve the life of uh, people around you or in the communities where you live or in low and middle income countries. Yeah, great tips. Thank you for sharing um, all of those tips with, with many of us. <laughs> I think I'm in the category of those that you are sharing the tips to also. So yeah, thank you so much for honoring this invitation. I, I really appreciate um we should the very best because um, we need answers so we can you can come back and share this interesting research with with Immuno Africa and spread it to the world. So wishing you the very best on your research. Thank you for listening to this episode on Immuno Africa. If you enjoyed it, please feel free to share it with your network. You will learn first about future episodes and get other immunology related updates by following Immuno Africa or the Immunology in Africa podcast on social media. See you on the next episode. Bye-bye.